young man, age 24. I was working nights as a security guard in a corporation in Massachusetts, and that's where I got saved. And there was only one other Christian that worked the second shift. He was the supervisor of the janitors, Brother Bill. And Brother Bill was a strange person to fellowship with at night because I had just gotten saved and I was so excited. I was studying the Bible, I was learning. And he was a seasoned old Christian. He was a deacon at his church. The problem was he never went to church. Not only that, I'd be excited about studying the Bible. And then I remember one day he came to me when I was uh, talking to him about the rapture of the church, the blessed hope of the believer. He said, you need to calm down. I don't think that's going to be what you think it is. And I said, well, that's what the Bible says it is. Yes, but I don't think it's going to take place like that. So he was trying to bring me down to earth a little bit, but... I was up in the clouds, so it didn't work very well. Amen. <laughs> he was a Pentecostal Christian, and then one day, he had boats and campers, and one day he pulls into church with this huge camper. I said, wow, Brother Bill, you, you've got everything. Boats, four-wheelers, campers. And you know what he said to me? I'll never forget this as long as I live. He said, the king's kids go first class. The king's kids go first class. And I know what you're thinking. We come to church and there's screens. Benny Hinn's going to be preaching the prosperity gospel here soon. Not going to happen. The message today is about the Lord, our rewarder. And I'm not preaching the prosperity gospel at all. But what I'm trying to tell you is God has promised to care for your needs. But here's the thing. We all raise children, right? There were times our children wanted things. It's kind of funny because when I buy things now, I, I take the attitude that forgiveness is easier than permission. And so, uh, you know, with kids, they always want things. And so one of the things we do for our kids is, you know, my wife may say, you don't need that. And we may say that to our kids. Well, you don't need that. Well, listen, we don't need much, do we? But every once in a while, we treat ourselves. There's nothing wrong with having something nice or receiving a gift. And I'm not talking about the king's kids going first class. But here's what I want to tell you. There are occasions where your Heavenly Father will bless you with something you desire. He'll give you the desire of your heart. He doesn't spoil us. We don't have the best of everything, right? But once in a while, He blesses us. That's okay. We do that for our own children. In fact, I bet most of them are going to be blessed at Christmas time this year when we celebrate our Lord's birthday, right? And so it's okay to bless your children. And what I'm trying to tell you is, we are God's children, and it is okay if He blesses us once in a while. And I want to talk about Jesus the rewarder because salvation is not a reward. Listen, I belong in hell. I'm a sinner. It's by the grace of God that Jesus, the righteous God, came to earth, left the glory of heaven. Shed his blood on the cross. Why? Because he loved me. And I know he loved you too. I, I grant you that. But he died for me. And so when I repented and trusted him as my Savior, I received the gift of everlasting life. And I became a child of God. Sorry. Try to shut it off. Here's the point. Salvation is not a reward. It's a gift. That's right. Amen. But today I want to tell you that God does reward the saved. He does reward the saved. So let's get into this. Hebrews 11. We're 
Remember, we're saved by faith. We live by faith. We worship a holy God. He said, be ye holy, for I am holy. How do you become holy? By being washed in the blood of the Lamb. You receive the righteousness of Jesus, God in the flesh. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We know that Hebrews 11 is the great faith chapter. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice. Why? It was a blood sacrifice. Verse 5, by faith, Enoch was translated. A foreshadowing of the rapture of the church. But I want you to look at verse 6, because that's what I want to preach about. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. You know what's interesting to me? That we as Baptists, we are works oriented. We think that spirituality comes from service. No, we serve God because we're spiritual, not to be spiritual. We need to understand this. He that cometh to God must believe. Must believe. Trust. Faith. We must believe that He is. And here's what I want to talk about. He is a rewarder, a rewarder of believers. But what kind of believers? What does the Bible say? I know what you're going to say. Them that seek Him. Well, you pray, don't you? You're in church today, right? You're seeking God, but is that what it says? Remember, when God words things, the wording's important. He's not saying those that seek Him. Is He? He's being more specific. He's saying those that diligently seek Him. There is a difference. Mm -hmm. What does the word diligent mean? It means to those who are searching Him out. Are you searching Him out? Are you praying and studying the Word of God? It means, it means to demand. Are you demanding of God? God, reveal to me through your Scripture and by your Spirit who you really are, your beauty, your essence, your holiness, your magnificence. It means to crave Him. Hey, I crave pizza all the time, but that's something different. Do you crave God? Do you crave Him? That's what the word diligent means. It's not talking about reading your Bible and praying and coming to church and giving out a gospel tract. It's talking about desiring to walk with Him, to know Him, to live for Him. Amen, preacher. Are you diligently seeking Him? And here's what I want to promise you today. And how can I promise this to you? Because God promises it to you. He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Amen. And listen, there's a remnant of people, even in this church, who are diligently seeking God. And I know who you are. And Jesus knows who you are. And guess what? I pray for everyone every day. And for those that are diligently seeking, I add an extra prayer. You know what I pray? I pray, God, please give them a blessing. Please give them a blessing. And you know what God does? He blesses them above all they could ask or think. Exceedingly, abundantly above. You're welcome. You're welcome. And I know some of you haven't received your blessing yet. I'm still praying. I'm still praying. I'm still praying. You will receive it. Why? God promises to reward those that crave after Him, that search Him out, that demand of Him, do you remember Jacob 
Now, Jacob wasn't the most spiritual guy, was he? So, this goes back to my preaching about you don't have to be perfect. You just need to make an effort. And you start at 51%. We'll save that sermon for another day. Do you remember when Jacob wrestled with Jesus? You know what he said to him? I will not let you go until you bless me. I'm not letting go until you bless me. That's what I'm talking about. And do you remember when he touched his thigh? Every step he took, Brother Wayne, every step. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I thought you folks would be excited by this message. I want to talk to you about Abraham. Abraham, he was a worshiper of God. He was a worshiper. You know, we as Baptists, we're so focused on service. And when we come to church, we all have a job, don't we? We're ushers and counters and uh, some of us give announcements and whatever we do, we're focused on the service and we're busy taking care of God's business. Praise God, but why are we here? We're here to worship. We're here to worship. Do you know what that means? That you need to see beyond your ugly preacher. You need to see Jesus. You need to understand that we are in the presence of Almighty God. And that we're here to worship Him. Not just to learn the Bible. Not just to see our friends. Not just to get a snack or whatever they do downstairs. We're here to worship the Lord of glory. Abraham was a worshiper. How do I know this? Where was he from? Ur of the Chaldees. Do you know that Ur was the capital of the Babylonian Empire? And what are they famous for? Baal worship. Mm -hmm. They were all false worshipers. And our God, the creator God, the possessor of heaven and earth, after Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel, remember? He said, I know, I'll call a man and make a nation out of him and I'll use him and his people to reclaim the world for me. So he calls Abraham. I want you to turn with me to Genesis 12. Do you know what James said about Abraham by the Holy Spirit? Chapter 2, verse 23. He said that Abraham, catch this, was the friend of God. The friend of God. Well, guess what? For me, the most incredible thing for me is to be called a son of God. I am so enamored that I am a son of God. Because Baal and all the false gods, you were their slave. But our God invites you not to just be a servant, but to be a son or a daughter, to be part of the family, to be in His presence. No other God offered this. And so He calls Abraham and He calls him the friend of God. Many years ago, I used to have to go to a physical therapist every week. And we would talk and we became friendly. But in the conversation, he very tactfully let me know that even though I was his client, I was not yet his friend. He would tell me a story and he said, if you were my friend, I would tell you this. And then after about a year, he said to me, my friend, because you are my friend, this is what you need to do. So I became his friend. And so that was supposed to be an honor for him to refer to me as his friend. Are you all with me? What an honor. What an honor for God 
to say, you're my friend, you're my friend, you're my friend. What an honor for God to say that. Why was Abraham the friend of God? He diligently sought him. He was a worshiper. Genesis 12, this is the Abrahamic covenant. The Lord said to Abram, Get thee out of the country from thy kindred, from my father's house, unto the land that I will show thee. And guess what? He didn't point to a map and show him where. He said, follow the Holy Spirit till you get there. That's how we are to live. I will make of thee a great nation. This is a promise from God. I will bless thee and make thy name great. Thou shalt be a blessing. And I'll bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. Remember the message? No weapon formed against thee shall prosper. I'll bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. And Lot went with him and he was 75 years old. What does he do when he gets into the land? Look at verse 6. He goes unto the plain of Moreh, the plain of Moreh, the most holy place in all the universe. And the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared to Abram, verse 7, He said unto thy seed, Will I give this land? And what's his response? He builds an altar. He removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent. Do you know what Bethel means? El is God, Beth is house. The house of God. Guess what? For all the home Baptists, this is the house of God. This is where our church family meets. In our Father's house. Not everyone in their own homes. Amen, preacher. Bethel, the house of God. And what does he do with this altar at the house of God? What does he do? He diligently seeks him. How do I know that? He calls on the name of the Lord. Doesn't your Bible say that? He calls on the name of the Lord. Lord Jehovah, Lord, it's me. Hear me. Fellowship with me. Meet with me. Is that what we do? He diligently sought God. Why? He was a worshiper. He knew how to worship. And God loved him for it. He was the friend of God. Go to chapter 13. Because he diligently sought the Lord, what does God do? Now be careful here. We lay up treasure in heaven. We are promised a glorified, resurrected body in the kingdom where the curse of the earth is lifted, where Jesus rules and reigns in righteousness. We are promised a home in the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem, and a mansion with streets of gold for all eternity. Our promises, our blessings are eternal and future. And I know none of us here are wealthy, but here's what I want to tell you. If you diligently seek God, He will give you a blessing here and now. He's our Father. He wants to bless us. You're not going to get a house on Rope Ferry Road in Hanover. You're not going to get the top-of-the-line self-driving Mercedes. It's not what I'm talking about. But it'll give you a blessing. You may get a farm. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Abram went up out of Egypt. Remember, Egypt's a picture of the world. He and his wife and all that he had 
Do you folks remember when Brother Rocky left to go to South Dakota? Brother Rocky left here years ago to go to South Dakota, and everything he owned fit in the back of his pickup truck. It's a scary thing. Abraham went with all that he had. But look what it says in verse 2. He was very rich in cattle, silver, and gold. And he went on his journeys from the south even to the house of God, Bethel. It's not in Vermont. It's the house of God. And where does he go, verse 4? Unto the place of the altar, which he had made there at the first. And what does he do again? He's diligently seeking God. Why? He's a worshiper. He's calling on the name of God. Oh, praise God. I'm glad I'm excited. <laughs> Hebrews 11, verse 8. I'll move it along. We seek God diligently by faith. We walk with Him by faith. We live for Him by faith. He lives in us and through us. How? By faith. We abide in Him and He abides in us. How? By faith. When He was called to go out into a place which He should have to receive for an inheritance, He obeyed. And He didn't even know where He was going. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise. By faith he believed those promises, that covenant. As in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac Jacob, the heirs with him of the very same promise. He was a wealthy man, and he lived in a tent. He lived in a tent. And you all know why. Look at the next verse. He looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker was God. He was one of the richest men of the East, and he still lived in a tent because he was looking for and living for God. He diligently sought him as a worshiper of God. He looked for a city which hath foundations. Are you looking for the kingdom? Are you looking for the blessed hope? Or are you all wrapped up in an election, in a pandemic? Are you all wrapped up in your own life and in your own finances? Your own family, your own jobs? Are you all wrapped up with the cares of this life? No, look for a city. Diligently seek Him. It's going to be okay, I promise. I want to talk to you about Joseph. Do you know Joseph was the deliverer of the nation of Israel? Do you remember they were in Egypt, the world? 400 years. Who delivered them from the world? God used Joseph. He was a deliverer. He will deliver you as well. And you know what the Bible says about Joseph? The Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. God showed him when he was very young that he would rise to a place of ultimate prominence. And he was despised and hated by his brothers, being the youngest at the time for his dreams. Do you remember what they did? They wanted to kill him. And God spared him. And they sold him into slavery. Do you remember what happened when he was a slave? He didn't murmur. He didn't complain. He didn't curse God and die. He diligently sought God. He did the best that he could. And God prospered him. And God was with him when he was a slave. And when he was put in prison, God was with him while he was in prison. God was with him. Do you want God to be with you? Diligently 
Seek Him. I'm not talking about having devotions. I'm not talking about coming to church. I'm talking about craving Him. Demanding His presence. Searching after Him. That's what I'm talking about. Go with me to Genesis chapter 37. Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger, the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah, and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought into his father their evil report. Now Israel, that's Jacob, he loved Joseph more than all his children. He was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. You all know about that. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him, and they could not speak peaceably unto him. And he dreamed a dream and told it to his brethren. They hated him yet the more. He said unto them, Here I pray you this dream, which I have dreamed. Behold, we were building sheaves in the field. And lo, my sheep arose, and also stood upright. And behold, your sheep stood round about and made obeisance to my sheep. Wow, what a dream. And his brethren said to him, they knew what it meant. They said, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams. But let me remind you of something. God called Joseph when he was young. And God made Joseph promises when he was young. But he never, ever, ever stopped diligently seeking God. And although God promised him he would rise above and be in a place of ultimate prominence, how did he get there? How did it happen? Right? Some of you have been through the fire. One problem, one trial after another. And here's what happens. We lose faith. We stop seeking. We say, God, you promised me this. It's not happening. It's going the other way. The more I seek you, the harder life is. And then we start to question God and blame God and fall away from God. Never. Joseph never did. He diligently sought him. Go to chapter 39. <clears throat> Joseph was brought down to Egypt. And Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard of the Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph. Can I say that again? The Lord was with Joseph. He was a prosperous man. He was a slave. It says he was a prosperous man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him. It was obvious to everybody. And that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight and served him. And he made him overseer of his house. And all that he had, he put into his hand. He knew nothing. He trusted Joseph with all of it. And you know the story. His wife tries to entrap Joseph. And Joseph ends up in the prison. Go to verse 20. And I want to remind you something. I don't know how long he was a slave. Maybe some of you men know but I know he was in prison for a long time, about 10 years. Joseph's master, verse 20, took him, put him in prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound. He was there in prison. What happened? But the Lord was with him. Preacher, I lost my job in the pandemic. I can't work. That's okay. Diligently seek him. He'll be with you. Lord, my family are sick. My children are depressed. Lord, there's trial after trial. That's okay. Diligently seek Him. The Lord was with Him. 
He gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. And whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. And the keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand, because the Lord was with him. How many times does God tell us this? Why is that, preacher? He was a deliverer because God was with him. And God was with him because he diligently sought him. Diligently. And you all know the story about the butler. Was it the butler, the banker, or the candlestick maker? <laughs> what happens when Pharaoh has a dream? Who do they call? He was forgotten in the prison, but who do they call? God puts it into remembrance. And at the right time, God's time, he's brought up. He interprets Pharaoh's dream. And he gives Pharaoh a plan to sustain the known world. The seven years of plenty store up for the seven years of famine. I want you to go to chapter 41. Genesis 41. Look at verse 39. We'll pick the story up here. Here's what Pharaoh says to Joseph. For as much as God hath showed thee all this. Look who Joseph gives the glory to. There is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand, and he put it on Joseph's hand and arrayed him in vestures of fine linen, and put a gold chain about his neck. You know what God's doing? He's rewarding him. He's rewarding him in this life. Why? Because he diligently seeks him. He made him to ride the second chariot which he had, and they cried before him, bow the knee, and they made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without thee shall no man lift up his hand or foot in the land of Egypt. And here's the name he had for him. I dare any of you to name your kids this. Zaphnath Paneah. Zaphnath Paneah. And he gave him to wife, Asenath. The daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On, and Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. I want to use the time I have left to talk about someone else who diligently sought God. That was King David. Mm -hmm. King David. Oh, before I have my devotions, I always turn to Psalm 42. And I say, Lord, Help me to be like David, as the heart panteth after the water, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. Help me to diligently seek you, like David. You know, Abraham was the friend of God, but you know what God said about David? He was a man after his own heart. He was a man after God's own heart. And even though he was imperfect like you and me, even though he had trials and lapses of faith, even though he sinned, his heart always turned to God. He diligently sought Him, and God blessed him. And David was a leader to God's people. He was a leader. And God blessed him. He took a shepherd and made him king of Israel. From shepherd to king, he rewarded David for diligently Seeking him. David had courage. He wasn't afraid. He slew the Philistines, the Ammonites, the Edomites, the enemies of God. He delivered Israel. Hey, he slew Goliath, remember? He had courage. It wasn't in the flesh. It 
was because he diligently sought God. God gave him that courage. It was a gift. But you know, David had compassion. Do you remember when all of Saul's family were slain with the sword? Jonathan had a little baby named Mephibosheth. And do you remember the nurse escaped with him to preserve his life? And when she dropped him, he was lame on his feet. But his life was preserved. And you remember, Samuel anointed David to be king when he was a shepherd. And it was years later, about 13 years later, when he finally became king. And you know what he said? Is there any left of the house of Saul that I might show mercy? He had a compassionate heart. And they brought in Mephibosheth. And he was lame. And he said to King David, Why would the king look on such a dead dog as I? And David looked at him and said, From now on, you will eat at my table all the days of your life. Amen. And in 2 Samuel 7, God makes a covenant with David. God made a covenant with him. I want to read to you 2 Samuel chapter 7. <coughs> it came to pass when the king sat in his house, the Lord had given him rest. Here's a shepherd sitting in the palace, king of Israel. Why? God rewarded him. He was a leader who diligently sought God. And the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in the house of Cedar. God has blessed me. He's rewarded me. But the ark of God, the presence of God, dwelleth within the curtains. He wants to build a house for God. And Nathan said, Go to all that is in thy heart, the Lord is with thee. And he promises him in the Davidic covenant that someone from his lineage would reign. God rewarded him because he diligently sought him. Do you understand what I'm saying? Go to Matthew 25, we'll close here. We'll just read a couple verses, verse 20. Our promises are eternal and heavenly. But we are God's children now. We possess eternal life now. Now are we the sons of God. And God will bless us from time to time. He will give us the desires of our hearts. The king's kids don't go first class because we're being persecuted. We're here on a mission. But we do get a blessing on the way. And one day when he comes, we'll be resurrected in a glorified body like Jesus. We'll be in the kingdom on the earth without the curse, with Jesus ruling and reigning. That's what we're living for. And we have more promises waiting for us, don't we? We're laying up treasure in heaven. Do you remember the parable of the talents? He that had received five talents came and brought other five talents. He took what God had given him and he brought forth fruit. How did he do that? He diligently sought God. He diligently sought God. God. Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. I have gained beside them five talents more. I diligently sought you. And what did the Lord say to him? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. You don't have to be perfect, you just got to make the effort. 
start at 51%. He said, I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. I'm trying to tell you, he's a rewarder. Salvation's a gift, but once we're saved, he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful that we are the king's kids. And Lord, we're far from first class now, but one day we'll be with you in your kingdom, in glory. And we long for that day. Help us to be faithful, to love you and serve you, but most of all, to seek you. Help us to diligently seek that we might pray with Nehemiah, remember me for good, O oh God. Remember me for good. And Lord, we thank you for your great protection and provision here and now. Please bless us, Lord. And Father, we thank you for the gifts you give us, the rewards you bless us with from time to time. We're grateful for your love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.